we are super excited to have Dr. Uh, Tamamagi with us. So um, before we get started, we would just ask that if possible, we would just ask that everyone um, turn on their, their, their video on their screen. Um, it just helps during the presentation when there's uh, faces to put to the words that you're saying. So if you're in a situation where you can turn on your screen, that would be wonderful. So, um, but again, we'd like to thank our distinguished lecturer, Dr. Martin uh, Tamamagi for joining us today. We are grateful and honored to have the opportunity to host Dr. Tamamagi as our distinguished lecturer today. Uh, Dr. Tamamagi is an epidemiologist and pro professor emeritus of health sciences at Brock University in Ontario, Canada. His pioneering research in the field of lung cancer screening has focused on the development of risk prediction models to selected high-risk individuals for lung cancer screening. He has been a co-investigator in the US prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer screening trial, the PLCO, and the US National Lung Screening Trial, NLST, and the Pan-Canadian Early Detection of Lung Cancer Study. Dr. Tom Magi developed the PLCOM 2012 risk prediction model, which calculates an individual's risk for developing lung cancer and is used to identify high-risk individuals for lung cancer screening. After we hear from Dr. Tom Magi, we will then open up the, the uh, meeting for a fireside chat where uh, people can ask questions. So without further ado, we will turn the time over to uh, Dr. Tom Magi for his presentation, and then we will I open up for the fire so chat after Dr. Tom Maggie. Thank you very much. Uh, now, do I have to share the screen again? I think. Uh, uh, yes, you should be able to. Uh, you you should have access to to share. Okay. Great. We can see your screen now. Okay, wonderful. Yep. Uh, so I'm going to ramble a little bit today and, and talk about a number of different topics. And uh, the uh, uh, I wanted to disclose that I do some consulting, uh, but none of that really will affect anything that I'm talking about today. And I was asked to talk about the PLCO 2012 uh, model, the risk prediction model. And so I'm going to ramble a little bit about that. I was also asked to talk about the uh, Lancet article that compares the task force criteria to the model for eligibility. So I'm gonna uh, talk about it as well. And uh, uh, I was gonna present some of the current work uh, that I'm working on and also future uh, of lung cancer screening. And some of these topics actually kind of overlap, three and four overlap. And uh, I'm, uh, probably not going to have a time to talk about all of them, but some of these topics I'm going to uh, definitely cover. Uh, <clears throat> uh, as you know, lung cancer is a major health problem, and I wanted to present this statistic here uh, because uh, I see it sometimes misrepresented uh, and incorrect numbers being presented. Lung cancer is the globally is the leading cause of uh, cancer mortality with about 1.8 million uh, deaths per year, but it is not the leading cause of incidence of cancer. Uh, it falls in second place after breast cancer. Uh, now, lung cancer screening reduces lung cancer mortality in high risk individuals, but not in low risk individuals. And this is why it's so important to estimate risk accurately. And I've met a lot of uh, highly educated individuals who believe that uh, lung cancer screening with uh, low dose CT uh, works well in high risk individuals, uh, but it also works uh, in low risk individuals, just not as well. Uh, but this might really be incorrect. And I wanted to present this figure that's based on NLST data. And on the x-axis, you've got the risk of lung cancer by the PLCO 2012 model. And on the y-axis, you've got lung cancer mortality rates. And in the red, you have got the CT arm in the NLST and the dashed line is the comparison group. And you can see that when the risk is high, 
uh, above 40%, that there's a definite uh, improvement, decline or decrease in mortality in the CT arm compared to the intervention or sorry, the control arm. But once you get low in the risk, there is no benefit from screening. In fact, uh, around the 35 percentile, the uh, CT arm has slightly greater mortality than the comparison group. And so that it's not correct to think that there's a little bit of benefit at the low risk uh, zone. Now, I wanted to also mention that lung cancer risk prediction models uh, are better, more effective at identifying individuals at risk and determining eligibility for screening compared to the categorical age smoking criteria, which many guidelines uh, and trials have used, including the NLST, the Nelson, the US Preventive Services Task Force, and the, the uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, the uh, prediction model is a good risk prediction model uh, in comparison to the categorical age smoking criteria, uh, have a better classification accuracy in terms of sensitivity and positive predictive value, more lung cancer deaths are averted, more life years are saved, the number needed to screen to avert one death is better, and uh, they are more cost effective. Now, I'm going to move on to talk about the PLCO 2012 model. And this model, it's a, lo a logistic regression prediction model based on PLCO data. It has 11 predictors, and it predicts six-year risk of developing lung cancer. It's been shown to have high prediction uh, in terms of discrimination and calibration. Uh, this is the coding for it, and although it might look complex, it's really not uh, very difficult at all and only requires high school algebra to understand, and so that this model is easily transportable into different settings and, and applications. Uh, the PLC 2012 uh, model has been validated in over 30 studies and uh, is being used or has been used in pilots, trials, studies, and programs in over 15 countries. Uh, one concern has been that the model uh, is too complex, too onerous, and too time consuming to apply. Uh, and I'm gonna approach this by presenting uh, a little bit of background to the uh, Ontario Health Cancer Care Ontario pilot. And this was a pilot that was in four different sites in Ontario and two satellite sites that went from uh, June 2017 to August 2019. And uh, the individuals that were enrolled uh, were enrolled based on the PLCO 2012 risk prediction model. Uh, they received two scans and uh, we, before starting the pilot, we did a fairly rigorous detailed health technology assessment in which we did uh, a qualitative and quantitative comparison between NLST-like criteria for eligibility versus the PLCO 2012. We found that the, that the model took slightly longer. Uh, the navigators did the risk assessment and several folk, a focus group with doctors preferred this. And uh, we then in the pilot had stakeholder interviews and the navigators who uh, did the risk assessment found no major problems with uh, administering the risk assessment. And we had participant survey surveys and the satisfaction was high or very high with the risk assessment process. And uh, the time that it took to complete the risk assessment and uh, uh, harms uh, benefit discussion was about 14 minutes. And uh, uh, in Europe, in the UK, uh, individuals that are using it also, like in the Manchester study, uh, found that they could do it as quickly, administer the risk assessment as quickly as in four minutes. Now, since uh, we did the pilot 
in Ontario. We've now converted the pilot into a full-fledged program in Ontario. And you can, uh, this is Ontario here. And uh, British Columbia now also has uh, developed their own program. Uh, and uh, there are two provinces, Alberta and Quebec, that are doing pilots, two programs that are underway. And other provinces and regions are also uh, planning uh, screening programs in the planning stages that are underway. And the different provinces are all so far using the PLC 2012 model, but some of them are using a no race version of the model. And uh, one uh, province, uh, Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan here, uh, is uh, requesting that I provide them with an Indigenous version that uh, only includes Indigenous versus all others. And uh, I'll get to discussing this a little later. Uh, in England, they uh, are using the PLC 2012 uh, model and also the LLP model uh, to assess risk. And they have uh, a national uh, English uh, lung health check program underway. And uh, they've gone uh, so far as to register and certify the PLC 2012 no race model with the medicine and healthcare products uh, regulatory agency. And they've gotten approval to use it uh, somewhat uh, similar to the FDA approval in the US. Uh, in Europe, they're a little bit behind some of the other countries. And uh, the uh, biggest project that is underway there is the four in the lung run, uh, which is in six countries, uh, including the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, Spain, France, and Norway. And they're planning on screening uh, 27,000 individuals. And they're also assessing the uh, uh, PLC 2012 no race model and they're, uh, they've simplified the uh, uh, risk assessment to these 10 questions, which are very simple and fast to Im uh, implement. Uh, the uh, PLC 2012 risk calculator, uh, several versions of it are available in uh, smartphone apps, including uh, iPhone and Android versions. And there's English and Spanish versions available also. And uh, they're fairly simple and fast to do. And uh, uh, some people can complete these in a matter of just a few minutes. Now, there's been also a concern about using risk models that they recruit older, sicker individuals with fewer potential years gainable. And uh, the uh, best evidence to uh, uh, give you an idea of which way to go uh, on thinking about this comes from the, uh, the International Lung Screening Trial. And it compares the US Task Force 2013 eligibility criteria with the PLCO M2012 uh, screening model eligibility criteria. And uh, uh, they uh, uh, enrolled uh, almost 6,000 individuals in four countries uh, in nine different sites based on whether they were either task force uh, uh, criteria positive or PLCO 12, uh, 2012 model positive. And so that the goal here was to look at the sensitivity, the cancer detection rate, and also the cumulative life expectancy of those diagnosed with uh, lung cancer. Uh, this Venn diagram uh, provides a sense of the sensitivity differences between the two groups. And uh, the two eligibility criteria to, um, both uh, identified 126 can individuals that came down with uh, lung cancer in the follow-up. Nine individuals were identified who came uh, down with lung cancer in the follow-up period by the task force criteria alone. And 
there were 36 individuals that came down with lung cancer identified by the PLCO 2012 model alone. And so this difference of 27 individuals is a 16% increase in the cancer detection rate, and it's highly statistically significant. So that the risk prediction model identified a lot more lung cancers than the task force criteria did. Now, uh, in terms of the individual participants that were studied, it is correct that the PLCO uh, selected uh, model selected individuals were slightly older. They had more COPD. Their comorbidity count was slightly higher and the life expectancy was about one year shorter than those individuals that were selected by the task force criteria. So that the, the fears about these parameters was correct. However, the number of uh, lung cancers detected was so much greater by the model that when you tally together all of the life expectancies gainable, the difference favored the model by a substantial amount by almost 250 years. And that was highly, and that was statistically significant uh, difference. And so that this uh, uh, study result uh, favors using the model over the task force criterion. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit here about the thresholds that we use for the model. Uh, in Ontario lung screening program, we use the 2% uh, over six years risk or greater to, uh, to screen, but other uh, jurisdictions and other guidelines uh, recommend using uh, other thresholds that range all the way down to 1.0%, which is the equivalent to the current Task Force 2021 uh, criterion. Now, why did we choose the 2% uh, eligibility threshold? In Ontario, doing a cost effectiveness analysis, we found that the uh, cost of a one uh, life year gainable uh, was less than $50,000. And that was deemed to be acceptable to health policy makers and so that that's why we went with 2%. Ideally, uh, once the uh, lung cancer screening program has been found to be successful, it would be nice to lower this threshold down lower so that we'd have greater sensitivity in capturing more lung cancers uh, in the future. I wanna briefly, quickly talk about uh, cost effectiveness and there have been a lot of cost effectiveness analyses that have been uh, all over the map. And this is a review paper that was done by Gober. And it uh, describes an analysis of 45 different cost effectiveness analyses that uh, looked at lung cancer screening. And only five of them looked at the risk prediction models for selection. Many of the cost effectiveness analyses were dated and were based on NLST data, for example. And the NLST uh, 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 data is also dated in that uh, modern contemporary lung cancer screening has advanced in many ways in, and become better than what was done in the NLST and better than what was done in the Nelson. And so that the performance in terms of public health benefit, uh, I think is better today than what you'd expect from the NLST results alone. Uh, one of the uh, probably more up-to-date uh, contemporary cost-effectiveness analyses uh, is the Manchester Lung Health Check uh, analysis. And they concluded that the um, uh, cost-effectiveness ratio uh, being about $12,000 US per quality uh, was cost effective and a good use of the limited NHS uh, resources. And they uh, suggested that there's no need to do further cost effectiveness analyses. It was time to move on to find out how to do screening better. Now, an issue when to stop screening. Uh, I wanted uh, switch topics to talk about uh, the upper end of screening 
And uh, these data come from Alberta and they describe uh, the lung cancer uh, survival uh, by stage one and two lung cancer and stratified by sex and looking at it by age as well. And I just wanted to highlight circled here that in green, the green line, it identifies that the five-year survival for those individuals that have early stage disease that get surgical resection that are women have got a 30% five-year survival. In men, the same statistic is 23%. Now, this suggests that if we can identify those sur survivors, that they could benefit from lung cancer screening as well. And they uh, might deserve uh, consideration for uh, receiving lung cancer screening. And modeling of life expectancy now is also improving so that we might have some tools to help choose, pick and choose those individuals that uh, uh, would have a good five-year survival expectancy. We've looked at these data also in the Ontario Cancer Registry and uh, it is very similar results. And it seems that the uh, surgeons are able to uh, pick out very nicely those people that they expect to do well. And so we have fairly <clears throat> optimistic numbers as to who has early stage disease, who receives resection and, and their five-year survival. Now, I want to go on to what is turning out to be a controversial topic, and that is, should we include or exclude race from prediction models? And the uh, 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 House uh, Ways and Means Committee came out with a report that looked at clinical decision support tools and the misuse of race. And uh, around the same time, another paper came out in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, looking at reconsidering use of race correction in clinical algorithms. And they argued that race is a social construct and that inclus and, uh, inclusion of race in models can lead to further stigmatization. And many jurisdictions like in Ontario and in England and in uh, many countries in Europe, they avoid using race and models. And in fact, in France, it's illegal to ask uh, an individual's uh, race for official purposes. And so that uh, that's why the no race version of the PLC 2012 model is, is commonly used. But I've recently encountered a counterpoint in a paper that uh, I've submitted for for publication. And the one reviewer expert uh, came up with the statement that they felt that if the policy to exclude race leads to reduced provision of healthcare services, that is tantamount uh, to inadvert form of racism. And so that they were arguing that, that uh, if uh, you can uh, cannot identify the factors, the social factors and determinants of um, race that would exclude it from a model, then put it in the model until you can do a better job. And so even if it's a social construct, that uh, 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 the it's the proof of the pudding that really matters, that you want to do the best for the individual. And so they, they had no problem with uh, including race in the model. I'm also involved with uh, uh, two studies in New Zealand in which they're studying how best to involve Maoris, introduce Maoris into the lung cancer screening, and also what should the effect magnitude be in the model uh, to best estimate the risk for Maoris. And those studies are led by Maori individuals, and they're not uh, at all embarrassed to be called Maori. They're quite proud of it. <clears throat> and so that uh, they prefer to include Maori in the risk prediction model. Okay, I just wanted to point out about starting screening, and uh, I don't have enough time to really talk about the indigenous population, but many indigenous populations uh, have greater smoking exposure, greater lung cancer incidence and mortality, and also they uh, 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 often are reported to have lung cancer starting at an earlier age. And so that we're looking at 
how early can we start screening them and should we really start screening them at an earlier age? And the one caution is, is presented in this paper here that uh, found that once you get below the age of 50, that the risk of um, breast cancer in women over a lifetime of uh, CT screening radiation exposure can be excessive and greater than the benefits from lung cancer screening. And so that they were recommending caution uh, uh, at screening individuals below the age of uh, 50. And so that that's a factor that should be taken into consideration because there's been a fair demand or request to start screening some individuals before the age of 15. I want to go on to talk about screening uh, individuals that never smoked. And the number of individuals that never smoke to get cancer uh, is quite high. And as an individual disease, it's in the top 10 list of cancers causing cancer mortality in the United States in much of the world. And this, these figures here on the left show smoking uh, changes over time up until 2065. And you can see that the population of, or the proportion of never smokers is increasing and the former smokers and current smokers is declining. And so that on the right, you have the lung cancer deaths by smoking status. And over time, the proportion portion of deaths uh, uh, due to uh, lung cancer in never smokers will increase and become even greater than in those who formerly smoked and currently smoked. And so that it's a relevant public health uh, problem. And uh, the issue is, should we screen them or not? And this paper by Kevin Tenhoff and Harry DeConnick uh, demonstrated that a, using micro simulation modeling that if you can identify individuals who never smoke that are at high risk, that they have just as much chance to benefit from lung cancer screening as do uh, ever smokers. And so that the issue is how can we identify individuals uh, who never smoke uh, who uh, are at high risk? And I present this slide here that shows the global burden of disease in 2019. And it shows that, that um, smoking is by far the most important cause of lung cancer death, attributing, uh, causing about 1.3 million deaths in 2019. But in second place, ca uh, causing over 300,000 deaths is ambient uh, particulate matter or air pollution uh, and so that the air pollution is an important factor. And there's a whole bunch of other factors down here that are not accounted for in models that actually could help explain risk. And I put this up here. These are uh, recently uh, obtained uh, articles describing modeling of uh, risk of lung cancer in those who have never smoked. None of them include air pollution, and many of them exclude many other important major factors. Now, this slide shows a calculator, and the calculator is based on the PLCO All 2014 model. And this model also includes those individuals that never smoked. And in the original form, in the validation data, it had an area under the curve of 0.66 which uh, in never, individuals that never smoke. I consider that area under the curve probably too low to, to use in a public health or clinical setting for determining who should be screened. However, what I've done is I've added to this original model, uh, air pollution, secondhand smoke, occupational and environmental exposures artificially. These uh, are based just on the literature. And it I demonstrate here that we've got individuals, uh, this individual as a hypothetical, has a uh, risk of 2.4% over six years. And that's above all of those thresholds that I showed you earlier, which would qualify this individual for screening by all of those different criteria that were used uh, earlier. 
And so that uh, if we could actually come up with a good model like this, we have the potential to identify individuals that uh, could benefit from screening that were uh, had never smoked. Now I present this slide because I prepared it all uh, for the world conference last year and it was in Vienna. And uh, I just wanted to show that, uh, I'm not gonna go through the numbers here, but I'm gonna get to the bottom line here that we would have to do about 21,000 risk assessments to avert one lung cancer death in somebody who never smoked. And that is way too much for active um, uh, navigator risk assessment to undertake. It would never be cost effective. So that we have to come up with new ways of uh, risk assessment whether community-based, family-based, individual-based, uh, friend-based, uh, using uh, apps, uh, smartphone apps or something like that. But we've got to come up with a new paradigm on how we would undertake implementing screening individuals that never smoked. Now, I'm running out of time here. I'm at 5.35. Do you want me to stop here and start yeah, with the discussion. Um, do you have, uh, ha Professor Tamaragi, how, how many more slides do you have? Well, I've got quite a few more slides, but the thing is that I've got them in sections so that I can kind of cut uh, um, uh, anywhere along the near, um, near or long term. Uh, if uh, people are interested in biomarkers, I can maybe go through the biomarker and then um just give you a sense of what i might have talked about to see if anybody wants to bring that those topics up uh, in the discussion that would be perfect thank you okay i'm gonna i'm gonna carry on then with the uh, the biomarkers uh this uh paper came out describing the biomarker the early cdt lung test and uh it uh, was based on a randomized control trial that took place in Scotland. And some people uh, that uh, uh, saw this in print believe that that's good enough that this model is validated. However, if you look at the results, you find out that really uh, this is not a proof of validation. This is proof of failure. And the sensitivity of this test in the randomized control trial was 32%. And if you've got a public health screening program, uh, uh, you're going to be missing two thirds of the individuals that have cancer, and you're already right off the bat failing. Uh, the uh, uh, lung cancer detection rate in two years was less than 1%. If you use a risk prediction model, uh, like the PLC 2012, in different settings, you get at least four times the detection rate and the risk prediction model is is very easy and cheap to use uh the stage shift also in this study was only 41 percent in other studies that have used risk prediction models uh the uh, uh stage shift was as you expect much better and this is what you expect to have uh if you're going to have a mortality reduction so just because an article gets published does not mean that it is a successful biomarker. Uh, in this case, the contrary. Now, I want to quickly go on to talk about another study that combined the uh, a biomarker panel of four biomarkers here with the PLC 2012 uh, model. And they uh, this uh, has been published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And they uh, looked at uh, about five, over 500 cases that came from the PLCO repository and over 2,000 controls. And they then uh, did uh, the assay and they uh, did this as a kind of a validation study uh, from previous findings that had also been published. And they found that in the blue, you've got the PLCO 2012 risk prediction model having an area under the curve of 0 
when you add the four marker panel biomarker to it, it bumps the area under the curve up to 0.85. And that is a statistically significant improvement, but it's also clinically meaningful improvement. It's actually very difficult to bump up the area under the curve once you're this successful, this high, bumping it up five units is actually a, a, a big achievement. Uh, when we compare the combined biomarker panel with the model against the US uh, Task Force uh, 2021, which is pretty sensitive, uh, we were about 10% better using the, the biomarkers and panel and the specificity was also better by about 7%. So that this shows that uh, that biomarkers have a potential to actually make a good contribution and improve on the um, the, uh, the model. Uh, now, I am, as to what I'm working on in the future, improving the PLC 2012 model. And this is just uh, a slide to show that there are a lot of factors that are available that have not been included in the model and that can help improve future models. This is, again, another look at the global burden of disease, causes of death, and things like asbestos exposure, secondhand smoke, uh, diet stone fruit, uh, and diesel, things like that have not been used in models yet. And so that we've got lots of room to make improvements. And I want, I think I can end on this slide here, where we use machine learning to uh, uh, use routine electronic medical record data to uh, predict lung cancer risk. And uh, the uh, model that was developed uh, used over 170 different predictors for the electronic medical records. And it came up and out outperformed other models, the PLCO 2012 model, and it looked very promising. The problem with uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, in this kind of setting is, that it might be identifying current cancers that need immediate clinical investigation versus future elevated risk for individuals that should be going for screening. Uh, often these models tend to be very system specific and might not be reproducible in different medical uh, settings. And uh, I worry about data leakage, about black box, about interpretability. And I think I'm going to end it right there. Perfect. That, that is wonderful. Th thank you so much for that. So um, I, that, I think now we'll turn over to our fireside chat. And um, Dr. Tom and Mike, if you wouldn't mind just um, maybe stop sharing your screen so, so that we can go back to the fireside chat format. Well, one of the things that is a tradition of these LC Distinguished Lecture Talks is an opportunity to just directly have our audience ask you questions. And we're really excited. Uh, again, I wanna welcome everybody to this talk. Um, Alex Anderson gave a really great introduction of Professor Tamamagi. I was introduced to, to Dr. Tamamagi's work because everybody called the PLCO model the Tamamagi Risk Prediction Model. And so um, Dr. Tamamagi is truly the foremost expert in this area. We're really, really honored to have him talk with us. Uh, and then Dr. Tamamagi, just to introduce you to some of the audience members, you know, this is open to public, but as you can see here, there's a lot of students, uh, college students, medical students, um, but we also have doctors and, um, and lung cancer survivors um, in, in our audience as well. So I think, um, I will turn it over to Alex Anderson, who's gonna moderate the fireside chat, and we'll go from there. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yang. And thank you, Dr. Tamamagi, for your amazing presentation. So uh, like Dr. Yang said, we're going to open up uh, for uh, questions for Dr. Tam Tamamagi. What we ask is that if you have a question, we would prefer that you speak it verbally um, so that Dr. Tamamagi, Tam Tamamagi can see uh, who's asking the question. So if you could raise your hand using the chat function um, in, in Zoom, the raise your hand function in Zoom, that would be great. Um, if you're not in a place where you can do that, if you want, if you want to just type in your question into the chat and then um, I can read it out for you, that is also, that is also great. 
Alex, do you want to say your yes. question first? Yes. Um, yeah, first of all, it was a really wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it and learned a lot. Thank you, Dr. Tomomagi. Um, my question is, in the one of the beginning slides, you showed um, a graph which showed that screening lower risk individuals had no benefit, and in fact, a slightly higher mortality associated with LDCT compared to chest x-ray. And I believe that was based off of NLST data. Um, that's correct. And so that's older data. So I, I was wondering with you know all of the improvements in the performance of lung cancer screening, with the development of lung rads, with the potential use of LDCT screening for um, you know CVD risk assessment, does that shift that that vertical line lower such that that's a would potentially be a rationale to start screening lower risk individuals? Uh, the uh... Uh, if you plot that out, what you uh, below that line, uh, that risk was a threshold where it became ineffective was 0.6 percent uh, per six years, and right now, currently, no guideline, no program has got gone that low, and so that uh, we would have to uh, actually change our uh, our ability to i think identify people that were that low by adding new predictors to it for example biomarkers and i showed you that four panel biomarker and it turns out that that four panel biomarker is successful at identifying individuals that were uh, uh, had pack years that were between 10 and 20 and so that they were at pretty low risk and so that i think uh it's not only a question of uh, the technology, which which is good, and I'll, I'll probably comment on that as well. The uh, but the, that I think we need uh, to add and strengthen our risk prediction tools to be able to select uh, those individuals that are seen to be at low risk who are really at high risk uh, due to biomarkers, genetic uh, profiling, polygenic risk scores, etc. Uh, and uh, the, the concern is that if they're really truly at low risk, then the harms might exceed the benefits, and you're going to have false positives and problems with with uh, harms done. And so that that, uh, but uh, I must say that from our experience in the Ontario Cancer Care Pilot and our program, uh, we're having uh, few harms done, uh, low false positive rates. Lung rads is working the uh, uh, low-dose CT scanning and reading by radiologists is working and so that everything is functioning better than what, what we've seen in past trials. Okay, uh, thank you. That's really helpful. Okay, I'll, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Didi. I just had a question. Um, about the usability of the model. First of all, it was just a really great presentation and so exciting to hear how well this model works. But I was wondering if you have any data on how usable the PLCO model is compared to the USPSTF guidelines, because it seems to have just a couple more factors um, and a little bit more involved decision making. Well, actually, the the uh, uh, in terms of the, the task force uh, comparison with the task force, uh, it has a lot more factors, 11 predictors, and so that, uh, and those are measured on a continuous scale if they're continuous. Uh, the task force criteria are categories, yes, no categories, and the categories lead you to making yes, no decision without having a real risk estimated. And so that if you were, for example, having a risk benefit discussion with a, with a, an individual uh, that came to your office, you couldn't really do that using the data from the task force criteria. You would have to revert to a true risk prediction model that gave you a probability of developing cancer per unit time. And so that that uh, that uh, I tried to show you there the, the difference, but there's a lot of data that will compare the task force criteria and the risk prediction model, and it the uh, almost always the uh, uh, model uh, statistically significantly, highly significantly outperforms 
the task force criteria in identifying cancers, finding cancers. The other thing that the task force criteria has had problems with has been disparities. Uh, in the past, it's had problems with uh, race disparities. Uh, blacks are selected less than whites. Uh, women are selected less than, than men. And uh, uh, we're recently now looking at indigenous populations as well, uh, but we're not finding disparities there. Uh, the, the more generous 2021 task force criteria includes more uh, individuals and reduces the disparity. But when we analyze the data, there's still some disparity present. And so that it is not eliminated altogether. So that there's there's a number of features about the, the old way of thinking uh, using the task force criteria that, that uh, can be improved upon using risk prediction models. Okay, thank you. And in Canada, do all screening centers or hospitals, do they have navigators to complete the risk prediction assessment? So in the US, many places don't have a navigator to help with screening. And I'm wondering what you thought in terms of could risk prediction models be implemented in the absence of navigators to help? Uh, so far, we have navigators at all sites that are doing screening. But the, uh, uh, the, the importance of navigator is it takes the burden of work off the shoulders of the doctors and the doctors strongly wanted to have navigators. But also our navigators uh, help process the participant from beginning all the way through the pathway of screening to the end, even if they need to go to treatment. And so that they develop a strong bond and our uh, uh, adherence rates are very high. Our adherence rates uh, are over 85%. And if there's an abnormality, they're all over 90%. And so that they that's partly due to the bond that they develop with the navigator. And the navigator also uh, helps uh, uh, kind of improve the processing of them. And so that I, I totally believe in the navigators uh, if a system can afford to, to have one. That's a really impressive adherence rate. Yeah. Um, Mike, you have a question. Uh, great, great presentation, Martin. I, I have a question with respect to consideration by the USPSTF to look at risk modeling as an option. You know, if we, if they stay with the same cadence, we're now two years into the USPSTF 2021. It'd be another five years before they release new guidelines. I, I know when they looked at their present 2021 model, they they considered risk modeling. Are you aware of any conversations to uh, consider risk modeling within the next year or two and possibly looking at the PLCO 2012 model with biomarkers? Uh, I have not. And, and uh, I, I've heard a lot of editorial comments about that. And uh, the uh, uh, thinking right now uh, is that they they probably won't switch over and one of the problems was when they came out with the uh their uh, the last guidelines uh, 2021 guidelines they uh, they didn't have the results of the international lung screening trial and so that they wrote that there was no evidence to base this on well now that that was published in the lancet oncology they have actual trial based evidence to base that on and so that my thinking is that they they could come up and revise and, and going with a, a joint uh, either or uh task force or model uh, yeah. and, and uh, unfortunately they might not go back to reassessing for a while and the problem is that there's the rate of smoking is decreasing the rate of cancer should follow down as well and some models that have looked at it have said that that really by the time you get into the 2030s the the need for lung cancer screening will not be as great as it is right now right now is the time you need to act and you need to 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 do uh, do the important work and, and the other comment is that 
that it seems like the rest of the world has leapfrogged and uh, believes in, in the uh, risk prediction models. And it's, it's only the US that is not adopted risk prediction models so far. Thank you very much. Dr. Honda. Uh, yes, hi, thank you very much. That was very informative. I, my question is, do you have any advice or, or recommendations for primary care providers who uh, will occasionally encounter a patient uh, that may have these multiple additional risk factors for which we don't yet or not yet incorporated in the model? So it may be someone, and I've met some of them who have two first degree relatives with lung cancer. They themselves are never smokers. They may also have been exposed to considerably high radon levels in their homes above, let's say 50, uh, where the, the I think the, the recommended threshold is, is four picocuries in the United States. So in those individuals, I understand that there's still no recommendation to advise widespread screening for a population of those people because we don't have the data yet. But when that individual is in front of you, what do you tell them? Because we know they are most likely at higher risk of developing lung cancer, yet we cannot tell them whether or not yearly lung cancer screening with CT would, would be of any benefit or harm. Yet they are seeking, one thing as physicians, we need to try to manage their perceived concern about risk. So and I've asked several oncologists, thoracic oncologists about that, and you'll get different answers. Some say, we don't have the data, don't do anything. Others will come up with their own sort of, well, for that individual, I would say a one-time screen at age 40. So I just don't know what to advise primary care physicians when you find yourself in that situation where people are aware of significant additional risk factors yet do not meet current criteria? Uh, ideally, it would be best to base that on the risk prediction model that would quantify risk. And there are now uh, statistical methods that will let you add uh, known uh, risk factors into the model, even though it's not based on current, uh, current study. And uh, the uh, and that, that's a very beneficial thing because the uh, NLST and the PLCO trials both were a quarter of a billion dollars in cost, and we'll never do another study like that for individuals who never smoked. And so that we have to come up with alternative ways of, of uh, quantifying risk. And so that there are ways, and uh, we're working on that right now uh, in, a, in a few studies that are looking at individuals that never smoked. And I'm hoping that within the next year, we will be able to come up with a model that will help guide you, that will help uh, um, include factors like radon and asbestos and, and, uh, and uh, various other environmental exposures and occupational exposures and diet, and, and uh, that will help uh, then quantify it. And if those models, if you use them, and then you found out that the individual had a risk of, say, 2% in six years, uh, you could then have an informed discussion with them about uh, what to do. And uh, with the models, you can at least, if they come up with, with uh, uh, say, that kind of risk at age 50, uh, you can screen if they come up with that score at age um, uh, 60, you, you could uh, recommend screening. And the other thing is that age is built into the model as well. We, we know the pattern of risk with age and so, so that, uh, that that would be uh, central to, to the model as well. So that I can't give you help now, but I'm hoping that I can give you help within the next year uh, that will let you actually do something based on evidence. Thank you, that, that was a really great question, Pierre, and a very insightful answer, Dr. Tamamagi. Um, just to kind of, jump on that, uh, or just to add on to that question, do you have any advice on, so for example, if the risk calculator says 2% in six years, would you then say, um, would, would you just advise annual screening or, or you know, if somebody had 7% um, risk in six years, how, how would you interpret how to 
um, how would you act on the, the information from the risk calculator in, in those circumstances? Okay, uh, if they had 7% risk, that, that's very high. And, and uh, the average person with lung cancer does not even have that high a risk. And so that uh, I would definitely want to uh, screen them. Uh, if their risk was lower, like 2%, then I would do at least one initial baseline uh, risk. And there's a model that I've got called the uh, the PLC 2012 results model. And it will take the lung rads result and incorporate that and add that in. Uh, the uh, and readjust the score. And there's another model uh, that is based on the PAN-CAN model, and it will let you uh, go from a baseline scan to biennial scan. If your risk is, if you've got a, a low risk or uh, and your scan came back normal, it will look at the combined evidence and then send you to uh, to a biennial scan, and so that, that that's a little bit safer to do. And I know that there are uh, places, uh, uh, jurisdictions in which they're uh, going immediately to every second year scans. Uh, uh, I think mostly driven by cost, not evidence. Uh, but uh, but yes, uh, uh, definitely, I would start off by scanning. Um, I, I know it's six o'clock, but do you have until six o five by any chance? I have lots of time. I, okay, I'm great. As long as you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for our audience, we'll we'll try to end it at six o five. But I, I know there are a couple more questions out there, and uh, Priyanka, I saw your hand was up. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Tamagi, again uh, for the presentation. I just had a question regarding the implementation of risk prediction models in general, but but also just about the PLCM 2012 model. And so, as you mentioned, implementation um, is is low in the U.S. And um, some have suggested that it it's more difficult to collect the information needed for each of the predictors included in the model. And for example, um, getting information on a family history of lung cancer might be more difficult than than race or um, a smoking history. And so it, I was just wondering, in your opinion, um, how can we increase the implementation of risk prediction models when when doctors already have very limited time for each patient? Well, uh, I would try to get somebody else in the office to do the risk assessment, uh, including if uh, we, we have uh, uh, individuals that uh, pr uh, or, um, provide them with an uh, uh, eye tablet and they do it on, on the tablet themselves and, and uh, uh, do their own risk assessment. Uh, in terms of the, mis the hardship of getting data, uh, there's a lot of variants of the PLC 2012 model, some of which do not include race, and, uh, some which don't include uh, family history, uh, some which uh, exclude uh, uh, other um, medical history parts, uh, because sometimes people are doing research or they just don't have access to all the data through through, through using medical, uh, electronic medical records. And so that there's a lot of versions that are short forms. Uh, usually the most important part of the model is all the four smoking components. The, each one of the additional components adds only a small complementary part. And so that if you needed to do a short form version, uh, I would recommend using the short form version, but the the smartphone app is also another uh, way that people can do it. Family members can do it for each other, and, and that's commonly done. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. You have a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> hello, Martin. Very nice talk. I'm sorry I arrived a little bit late. Hello, Jeff. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned anything about years since quit, and uh, it's a categorical category that the task force uses, um, and it's in some models also. Um, <clears throat> did you do you have any thoughts about this? Yes, I, I I've uh, uh, it's in my, it's in the PLC 2012 model, and uh, we've looked at it repeatedly in different populations, and it's an important predictor. Um, uh, it's an important cause of failure of the task force criteria and missing people that have lung cancer. And in fact, I've got a paper right now under review uh, that we looked uh, at uh, an indigenous population in South Dakota. And uh, there, again, the most important determinant of failure of the task force criteria was uh, that people were uh, coming down with lung cancer 
uh, at six, uh, age, uh, 16 years after quitting, but sometimes even 25 years after quitting. Uh, I plotted the, the risk, and it's in one of my papers, and even at 25 years, uh, you can be over the 1% threshold, which is equivalent to the task force 2021. And so that I think that is probably going to be one of the things that the task force should uh, change. And I've also talked a lot to people that are concerned about that. And that's one of their number one complaints that they've got, that that's not a reasonable uh, rule to go by. Yeah, it seems to me that the desire to populate a trial carried over into recommendations without um, giving it much thought. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to mention one other thing, though. The issue of using the risk prediction, um, you know, an algorithm to, to identify people at higher risk, just really collides with the ability of primary care to even use a, a recommendations like the task force. But I, I completely agree with you. We are leaving a lot of prevention on the table by a, a categorical approach to identifying people on the basis, you know, for their eligibility. Yeah, I, I can't understand why it's such a hardship to do the risk prediction model. When I go in to see my uh, my primary care provider, she pulls up the the I think the the Framingham cardiovascular uh, risk calculator and asks me about uh, different risk factors for heart disease. And within two minutes, she tells me that you got eight uh, percent chance of getting uh, a heart attack in the next ten years. And so that uh, they seem to be able to manage and do it uh, fine. And uh, if they can do that for, for cardiovascular disease, why can't they do that for lung disease as well? There, there's no reason Mike could probably comment on this, but I think it's a culture of primary care thinking in terms of diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular disease as sort of daily um, priorities for prevention, but cancer is just invisible. And, uh, and it's also built into some of the EHRs, so that makes it a little bit easier, whereas these other programs are right now are standalone. But it's it really does have to happen. Yeah. Well, I know that uh, some places have put Ep uh, the PLC 2012 built it into their EPIC, and so that uh, they're, they're collecting it uh, more regularly than other institutions. Great. Well, th thank you so much. It, it is um, 6.06, .06, and so want to respect everybody's time. Um, I just noticed, uh, so just wanted to introduce um, some of our audience to our the rest of our audience. But anyways, um, Dr. Bob Smith, uh, really appreciate you for joining. Um, for our team members, he is the chair of the National Lung Cancer Roundtable. Um, and then um, Dr. Gieske, um national leader in, in lung cancer screening, Dr. Pierre owned for um, lung cancer survivorship awareness. I want to thank Kristen Kimball also uh, for coming. Uh, Dr. Mary Cooley, who's uh, at the Brigham, working on a ton of fantastic work with smoking cessation. Um, there's probably some other folks uh, I'm not properly acknowledging, but th thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm going to give Alex Anderson our um, the the concluding remarks. So. Thank you, Dr. Yang, and thank you to everyone who who came and, and listened to Dr. Tomilongi's presentation. I I think that. Everyone will say that it was it was amazing and it was great to just learn about all the things that, that you're doing to help help raise awareness for lung cancer and to help you know with the risk prediction modeling and everything like that. So on behalf of Alsi and everyone else here, we'd just like to thank you so much for taking time out of your day, Dr. Tomamagi, to come and speak to us and help us learn more about lung cancer and and fuel the fire under our efforts to to help to help prevent it. And um, yeah, without, with, yeah, we would just like to thank everyone for, for attending and we hope that you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure meeting everybody and getting to know more about you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.